Hello, Kidney Warriors! James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, for all of you that are new, welcome. Go ahead and let us know that you're new in the comments, and that way everyone can get to know you. We got a great community that is very supportive and very helpful, and you're gonna find that they are a great resource for support, motivation, inspiration, and sometimes you got those strange little odd things that you need to get a question from somebody who's actually been there. Our community probably has a good answer for you. Now, for those of you that are new, let me quickly tell you about myself. My name is James. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a dietitian. I'm just a regular person who happened to one day end up in the ICU for a week and discovered I have kidney disease. Not, do, not only just kidney disease, I had stage five kidney failure. I had a single digit GFR. Now, while in the ICU, they had me hooked up to IVs and all sorts of stuff, and they took care of me and got my GFR up and stable to 13. Mm, not a great number. The doctor said, that's as good as it's gonna get, James. You need dialysis and a transplant. Well, I said, put the brakes on dialysis. Give me a chance to try a few things like diet and lifestyle changes. I was drinking tons of Dr. Pepper and eating all sorts of bad things. Wasn't exercising as much as I should. I wanted to give that a chance. So I overnight, shoo, changed my life. And over the next two years, my labs improved and continued to improve. And the symptoms that I suffered started getting less and less and eventually they all vanish. Today, I am here, stage three, GFR 33, but I don't care about GFR. If you watch my videos, it means nothing. What matters is how I feel. I have tons of energy. I feel great. I do not have a single symptom. So that's a little bit about me. Now today, our guest back again, he's been here many times, you guys all love him, is Dr. Rosansky. He is a retired nephrologist and the author of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, a great book for kidney patients. And I'm gonna put a, a link right here above me that could take you right to it on Amazon. This is a very affordable book. It is written for kidney patients. You do not need a medical dictionary to read this book. It's got all sorts of great, helpful, easy to follow information. This book, it is getting so worn down here, folding pages over, making notes. And many of you guys have bought this book and have said, I love it, just like me. So our guest is the author of that book, Dr. Rosansky, also known as Dr. Rowe. Hey, Dr. Rowe, how you doing? I'm good, James, I'm good, how are you doing? Hey, doing fantastic. Now, for those that are new, tell them a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I uh, got interested in kidneys back in medical school, uh, which was in 1968, a long time ago. And uh, back in those days, <clears throat> there was, as a non-surgical doctor, there wasn't much that you could do. But dialysis came into play back then and kidney transplantation. So I said, wow. That's for me. So I've been practicing as a kidney doctor over 40 years. Uh, I set up a kidney program in South Carolina and um, I've done a good bit of research, a lot of patient care, and uh, decided to write a book for patients uh, after I realized that there's not much out there that uh, is really useful and is actually science-based. My book is fully science-based and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of what I call the woo-woo out there that uh, patients uh, are exposed to and give you the alternative. And that's why I called it Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, since there's a lot of woo-woo, a lot of nonsense. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. Yeah, so as kidney patients, we are bombarded on the internet pretty much by two things. Doom and gloom. <laughs> There's just so much of it and it doesn't need to be out there. And those of you who have seen past shows, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. And I am a walking, living, breathing example that it is not all doom and gloom. And then we're also um, bombarded with so many cures, fixes, helpful things that really, they don't work. And that's a big part of what we're gonna talk about today to help steer you guys in the right direction. So you're not wasting money. Well, what would you call it, Dr. Rowe? Woo-hoo? Woo-woo. 
the woo woo. The woo woo. There's a lot of woo woo. You might want to call it doo doo. Some exactly. people call it all different kinds of things, but you got the idea. I think everybody gets the idea of what we're talking about. Yeah, so, so let's go ahead and let's jump right on into it, Doc. All right, so tonight what we're going to talk about is ways to keep you from the dreaded dialysis. No matter what your stage of kidney disease, everybody worries about that horrible dialysis. And it is pretty, pretty horrible. And we want to try to keep people off dialysis as much as possible. But first, you know, let's talk about what's out there. And the National Kidney Foundation strongly advises any, this is the U.S. National Kidney Foundation, strongly advises anybody with kidney disease to stay away from dietary supplements and these uh, herbal treatments for good reason. Some of them actually can poison your kidneys. There is an actual uh, uh, herb that is in some of the Chinese medicines that has caused kidney failure. And some of these things may interfere with the medicines you're taking. They may have high potassium, which some people have to avoid. They may have high phosphorus. So they may interact with the drugs you're taking. And, you know, I, I looked, and James is, is an expert on this. And by the way, I have to say that <laughs> James- quite an expert. It's all from experts like you who share their time and their information. James is really a great service to anybody with kidney disease because he's not going to take anybody on his show that's going to push woo-woo. He's going to mm -hmm. only take people that have good credentials and that are going to talk to you about science and what really matters and what really works. Um, so some of the things to kind of be careful of is you'll see on the internet, natural path, Chinese herbs, beet, beet kidney disease, kidney coach, kidney disease solution. And, 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 if, you, and if you dig into this, I um, recognize we'll see, all of those. <laughs> if you dig into it, you'll see what they're pushing. And, um, and, and I want to give you a good example. So one of these uh, sites is pushing something, which I, you know, James probably knows more about, it, called Cheeto Sand, one of these herbal treatments. And, um, and guess what it's got? It's got one animal study. Meaningless. Do you, are you animals? Are you rats? Are you rabbits? I mean, you're humans. And anything that I talk about in terms of any kind of medications that may help your kidney function have been studied with tens of thousands of patients. And in order to prove something works, you got to study it with a sugar pill, a placebo versus the drug. And it is rigorous, and the FDA makes you go through lots of hoops to make sure that these drugs are safe and that they really work. So if you are interested in taking anything for your kidneys, make sure it is something that's been studied and studied well. And that's the only thing that I will recommend for you. But let's have a little fun. So let's and it's have a little always fun. great, yeah. you know, anyone out there who thinks, hey, here's something I want to try, because I fell for these too. When I was first diagnosed, there's these big giant websites of, hey, here's my the plan, $100 for a PDF, and we got these pills and blah, blah, blah. And they have all these pictures and things, and it looks so legitimate. And then you buy it, you start taking it, things aren't going well, and you ask your doctor, hey, doctor, I bought this stuff, I've been taking it. <laughs> and my doctor at one point said, if you buy any more stuff, I'm going to tell your wife, take away your credit cards. You're not buying anything online. Only yeah. what I tell you or your dietitian tells you. That's the only things you need to get. So let, let's deal with the, the creatinine. Everybody hears about their creatinine and they hear about their GFR. Mm -hmm. GFR is one way to measure GFR, which is a measure of how well your kidneys are functioning glomerular filtration rate is by using creatinine. So a lot of these sites will give you various things to take care of that creatinine, which they claim is harmful. Nonsense. It is a normal product of metabolism in your muscle. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's not harmful. As a matter of fact, people that everything else being equal, 
if I happen to be muscular and have have a high creatinine, mm-hmm. and James, we, we weigh the same, but he has less creatinine because he's less muscular, let's just say, I'm probably going to live longer. Having high creatinine is a correlate to living longer. So that's absolute woo-woo. It's bogus. Yeah. And they you know, say- so many sites focus <laughs> on the creatinine that it gives the impression that that's the thing that's the problem. And that's why yeah. <laughs> I constantly am now saying, I don't care what my GFR is. It's how I feel. What symptoms do I have? What's my energy like? How are the rest of my labs? If I'm feeling great and able to go out, jog for three miles without, you know, collapsing, woohoo, I am happy. Yeah. So um, they say that, well, since you excrete creatinine, it must be harmful. No, 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 <laughs> nonsense. It's normal. It's just a marker. Then they say, well, you got to be on the right diet. You got to eat your cucumbers, your garlic, your onions, your carrots to get your creatinine down. Nonsense. And let me give you another red flag. If there's anything out there and they give you testimonials, testimonials are woo-woo. You don't want testimonials. You want to see where the particular product was studied and whether it was approved by the FDA by going through four stages of research, randomized controlled trials. That's the only thing that you want to consider putting in your body because stuff, other stuff can be harmful as we already mentioned. So here's some of the harmful effects they say of creatinine, just nonsense. It's going to give you fatigue, swelling, confusion, headache, nonsense, nonsense. Save your money. Those all sound yeah. like things that are normal just from lower <laughs> kidney function and maybe too much sodium and stuff. <laughs> um, you know, some of the things revive kidneys, you know, renal health, kidney support, Albutrex. I mean, I would save your money and not fall for these things and don't fall for testimonials. Testimonials. Look for, and in my book, every chapter is heavily um, uh, referenced. I go, I give you the references. I give you the actual science. And that's why I call it learn the facts. I was going to, I was going to call learn the truth, but people didn't like that. They say you're calling other people liars. I don't need to get into calling people liars, but the facts (laughs) are based on science. So, um, if we're going to talk about how to keep you off dialysis, how to slow the decline of kidney function, that dreaded decline of kidney function. First thing you need to know is one size do, does not fit mm-hmm. every patient. I will say, and we had a, a, a show on my smart diet for kidney disease. And I know a lot of people emphasize diet. Diet is great. I am all for the smart diet, a plant-based diet, a healthy diet, mm-hmm. you know, low in fats, low in saturated fats, low in cholesterol, low in red meat, you know, um, very healthy. And, and why do I call the diet that I recommend the smart diet? Because what you're doing is you're decreasing your risk of atherosclerosis, hardening mm-hmm. of the arteries. And especially if you're diabetic and kidney with kidney disease or anyone with kidney disease, the main concern that you should have is you don't want to get hardening of your arteries, which can result in heart attacks and strokes, heart failure, bad stuff. And that's why the SMART diet, as well as lifestyle changes, are highly recommended for anyone with kidney disease or or without kidney disease. Yep. So what are some of the things that will, uh, that correlate to uh, how fast you're losing kidney function? One thing is blood pressure. Now, Mm. your blood pressure should not be too high and it shouldn't be too low. And depending upon what your particular situation is, you may have a different goal for your blood pressure. The normal blood pressure goal is roughly 130 over 80 or 85. Um, And uh, let's say 130 over 80. So this has been intensely studied. Tens of thousands of patients to figure out how low do we need to get blood pressure. Now, everybody says, well, we all know that you got to reduce your blood pressure. Well, guess what? Back in the 60s, they had randomized controlled trials. Get this, James. 
Uh -huh. Well, you could have a 230 to get in a research study back then. You had to have a 230 over 120 blood pressure. These Holy were via, cow. And you were either going to get a placebo <gasps> or you were going to get the drug. Because we didn't know. We didn't even know whether treating blood pressure is going to help you. And sure enough, it was easy to show that treating that kind of blood pressure will save you from getting a stroke or a heart attack and, and kidney failure. Mm -hmm. um, but there, we've gone pretty far with blood pressure and there's been a lot of debate, how low should you go? And there's been a ton of research about how low you should go. And I'll summarize it for you. 130 over 80 for most of you. If you happen to be a young person and you happen to also have, and we'll discuss this in a minute, a good bit of protein in the urine, like two plus or more, or 300 uh, in the US, it's 300 milligrams per gram of creatinine. We call that a spot urine for protein. If you're one of those folks that is in the high protein range and you're fairly young, shoot for a 110 to 120 as your top number, your systolic. Why don't we have everybody doing that? For good reason, guess what? If you go too low, you're going to hurt your kidneys. If you go too low, you can hurt your heart. You can actually mm -hmm. precipitate a heart attack. If you go too low, you could theoretically even cause a stroke. So you don't want to go too low and you don't want to get too aggressive unless you are at risk of losing kidney function uh, more quickly. And is it correct that if your blood, your blood pressure is what powers kind of your kidneys and if it goes too low, yeah, exactly. Your kidneys aren't going to work as well because the pressure it needs isn't exactly. there. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. James, you hit it, you nailed it. Yeah. If you're not getting enough blood flow to those kidneys, they're not going to be happy. And I'm not going to get into the details of kidneys ought to regulate. There's all kinds of fancy things. But, um, and, and i and, and as an academic I'm doing doctor, this I'm for not... someone who asked the name <laughs> of your book. <laughs> and there's a link right up there. It takes you right to it on Amazon, guys. Yeah. Thanks, James. I'm, I'm not just a clinical doctor. I've done a lot of research and I've reviewed research from other colleagues. And um, at any rate, let's just leave it at that. I'm not going to go too far into the weeds. So blood pressure is one thing. Um, another thing is how much protein do you have in your urine? Let's 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 mm -hmm. let's get on. Let's get on that one. That go that ahead. one. It's funny. You're the only one who really talks about that, though. <laughs> It is so important. And when I was first diagnosed, that was what my doctor was focused on. Let's let's see if this we can get this protein down by making changes. And I'm focused on creatinine because everything online almost seems to say creatinine is bad and we got to lower it to make kidney function go up, which is not correct. Focusing on protein, though, is something that definitely we should be doing because as you're about to talk about, if we can make improvements there, those are real improvements. And it also helps us determine how good or bad our kidneys are doing or progressing. Exactly, James. And let me tell you, I agree with you. I think uh, there's been uh, my colleagues, academic colleagues that have promoted this idea of everybody knowing your kidney number. And I think it's caused a lot of confusion, a lot of unnecessary fear. And we talked about that in our session when we talked about CKD3, which is the vast majority of you, CKD3. You, most of you really don't have anything to worry about. If you happen to have CKD3 or even higher levels of kidney function, CKD3 is 30 to 60 as your GFR number. Um, but you got protein in the urine, it's a lot more important. Mm -hmm. You may have a 60, 70, and you've got 2 plus, 3 plus protein in the urine, you got a problem. That's much. And, and James... We don't, we don't do as much urine protein checks as we should do. Yeah. The labs are pretty standard. Any, any, anytime you go to your doctor, they're going to do blood tests and you're going to get a kidney number. Mm -hmm. You but get a your EGFR and they that don't seems get to you. be it. Yeah, they don't get the urine protein, which I totally agree with you, can be a lot more important even mm -hmm. than, your, than your GFR number. So if you happen to have two plus or more, uh, or you have 300 or more, that's U.S. Uh, measures, it's different uh, in, in other countries, um, 
you, you need to be on, for your blood pressure, drugs that are called ACE, and they end in P-R-I-L, the PRIL drugs, mm-hmm. or ARBs, and they end in T-A-N. You can look at your medications and see if the last letters are P-R-I-L or T-A-N. They're the ACE or the ARB drugs. Now, those drugs should not be taken together. And, and frankly, when they came out and there was such good results, and I was actually, I, was, I participated with my patients in, in lots of those studies. Um, and I said, well, if one is good, why don't we combine them? Mm-hmm. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Why? Because they will lower your kidney function. And we're mm-hmm. going to get to that in a minute. So now, I want to um, jump on like a few of the comments yeah. that have, have come by. When sure. we talked yeah. about blood pressure, mm-hmm. what are what do you think are the best things people can do to lower their blood pressure? If you've got high blood pressure, I certainly think you can attempt to 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 do plant based diet, to do low sodium diet. We eat a ton of salt. If you will look at food labels, you'll see that we're eating five ten grams. Of sodium a day and the recommendation is two grams we got a long way to go if you can reduce your salt intake good idea if you can get on plant-based protein good idea <clears throat> if you can get yourself to exercise at least 30 minutes a day good idea all of those things and sleep and try to decrease your stress of course it's hard uh, but yep. try to get get as much sleep and try to do things to decrease your stress and stay away from party drugs. They will mess with your blood pressure and can cause strokes. So you really got to be careful. And I've seen too many young people come in with bleeds in their brain with massively high blood pressure, stay, taking street drugs. Oh, be careful. Be careful. Yeah. yeah. And then I went, I'd add down there. One of the things that, you know, um, if your doctor prescribes blood pressure medication, Take it as prescribed. There are apps that can remind you, hey, you got to take your your morning dose. You got to take your evening dose, whatever it is. Take it as prescribed. Blood pressure medicine isn't something you can stretch out and say, you know what? I'm going to get this one month supply to last six months by taking it every three days. It doesn't work that way. So if you are on blood pressure medication, take it as prescribed and don't miss any doses. I I, I'm, I got, I'm going to have to disagree with you and I'll tell oh, you why. Okay. I'll tell you why. Okay. You, everybody needs to get a, go to, go to your drugstore and get a digital blood pressure monitor. I'm looking they're for very, mine. Oh, mine's not here with very me. Very easy to use. <laughs> and here's my advice. Just like I said, you don't want it to get too high. You can clearly cause strokes, heart attacks, heart failure, kidney failure. No question about it, but you don't want to let it get too low. And James, I can't tell you how many patients I've seen and how many friends, including myself, that are on blood pressure medicine. Mm -hmm. And at one point or another, their blood pressure is low. I mean, 90 to 100 on your top number. And if you go ahead and if you go ahead and take your pill at that level of blood pressure, you can cause yourself some harm. You can yeah, pass yeah, yeah. Go out. too low. Okay. So my advice is to, if you're feeling weak or dizzy, especially standing up, be sure to take your blood pressure machine and check your blood pressure in a sitting position and a standing position and see if it's going down to that level 90 to 100. Hold the dose of medicine. If you're getting those kinds of symptoms, you can save yourself from serious problems. And people don't tell you that. And I'll, and what you'll see on the bottles of blood pressure drugs, like all other drugs, do not stop these drugs. But that is not <laughs> mindful. You've got to think about if you are having symptoms of low blood pressure, mm-hmm. not a time to take your dose. Wait till your blood pressure is back up to 130. It's not going to harm you. And then take the next dose. You can skip a dose in those situations. You follow me? And, yep, yep. and is not, nothing replaces checking your own blood pressure. Don't get obsessed with it. Don't take it five times a day. You know, it's good to take it, you know, a couple times a week. Give it to your doctor. 
And, um, you know, I've done a lot of uh, my research work on hypertension. A lot of it's doing 24 hour blood pressure monitoring. And I'll tell you, it's, it's really amazing about how blood pressure can vary on the different conditions. And a lot of you folks may have high blood pressure when you go into your doctor's office. And you may be 160 to 180 in your doctor's office and you check it at home, you're 130. Yeah. And so you've yeah. got to be careful that you don't have white coat hypertension. And that's another way that you can wind up getting overtreated. So monitor your own blood pressure. One reading in your doctor's office is worthless. You want to get mm -hmm. as many readings as you can. Theoretically, 24 hour blood pressure, seven days a week would be the way to really know what's going on. But you don't need to do that. If you could do it a couple times a week, morning and night, you know, change it up, you'll get a good idea. Yep. So, now, now let's um, jump over to ahead. protein in the urine real quick. There's okay. a lot of questions about that. Um, sure. What the question that came up quite often was, what is that test that they should be getting so that they can find out their protein in the urine? Okay, so there's two general ways to measure protein in the urine. One is they have those little strips they're called dipsticks. They measure sugar, they measure protein, they measure blood. They dip that stick in the urine. It's not a uh, exact measure of how much protein you're spilling, but it'll give you a ballpark. And if you do several of those, you'll get a good idea of how much protein you're spilling. A better way, which your doctor will probably recommend, is you get a sample of your urine, it's called a spot urine, you don't need much, a little bit of urine in a test tube. And the lab will do an analysis to look at how much uh, protein, in this case, albumin usually, is in the mm -hmm. urine. And they'll measure it, the amount of albumin in the urine versus the amount of creatinine. It's, so it's called the albumin-creatinine ratio. And in the U.S., a ratio of a 300, that would be in milligrams uh, of uh, of uh, albumin uh, per gram of creatinine, you know. So um, it's, anyway, yes, you roughly, uh, you should not be putting out more than five or 10 milligrams, uh, up to 30 milligrams. So 300 is high, over 300 in that spot test. That, yeah. means, you, that means that you are one of the folks that should definitely be on either an ACE or an R. And one thing that may happen, so, you, you know, people say, oh, and I said, well, let's combine the ACE and the R. If one works, and why don't we use two of them? Well, they both can cause a decline of kidney function. And this is a paradox. So here's the deal. If you have protein in the urine, two plus or more, 300 or more, and you happen to get a decline, you got to be followed up. And a lot of the kidney doctors say even a 30% decline initially doesn't mean that you should stop taking an ACE or an ARB. You got to discuss this with your doctor. And a lot of kidney doctors say, well, the short term, it may go down a little bit, but over years, and we're talking about, when we're talking about keeping you off dialysis, we're not talking mm -hmm. about days or weeks or what my lab test is going to be or how much water I should drink to get my creatinine better or what food I should eat. That doesn't make any sense. You're looking at this from a long-term perspective over many months and many years. So over a long period of time, over years, even if your initial drop in, in kidney function occurs, over many years, if you're one of these folks that has a good bit of protein in the urine, it still may be wise to continue it. And if the drug actually decreases urine protein, that's a good sign. That shows that you may be benefiting from the drug, which may help you slow the decline. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of message on the, uh, the ACEs and the ARBs. Very uh, good. Okay, if you want to ask more questions or should we go into low protein? Nope, diets? we're ready to go on. Those, are, those, those two topics were very popular in the comments. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> So, um, one of the things that got me to write the book is all, every other book that I read was just pushing this low protein as the cure, low protein diet as the cure. 
And uh, one of the books that was actually pretty old, I think it came out in 2004, from a colleague, uh, was a fellow who actually passed away from Hopkins, all about protein, talking about some of his patients went on low protein diets. So let me give you the, the essence of the protein story. Um, and again, going back to plant-based diets, great. Not gonna magically give you a change in your EGFR or your creatinine, don't look for that. You're looking to be on a plant-based diet for your long-term health. Mm -hmm. So um, in terms of protein, what do we eat normally? About 100 grams of protein. I, I probably was eating way more than that too before maybe. all this. I yeah, yeah. I, average, I, average, yeah. When I went to the store, every package advertises twenty grams of protein packed with protein. It it felt like we needed protein, and right. the more the better. And I right. fell into that trap. Yeah. Well, here is the deal, James. Protein is critical for. Uh, building the body, building the muscle, keeping you in good nutritional shape. But we eat too much protein on, on average. We eat too much protein. 100 grams is too much. So what is the recommended uh, diet for people with kidney disease? First of all, diabetics, there's the recommendation by the kidney organizations is don't push the low protein in diabetes for good reason. As a diabetic, you got to watch carbohydrates. So think about it. If you got to watch carbohydrates and you're cutting down your protein, what do you got left? Fats? I mean, you're going to get malnutrition. It's and you're <laughs> going to get you're going to wind up getting low blood sugars. Mm -hmm. And that's dangerous. Low blood sugars in a diabetic are extremely dangerous. So you got to be careful. So in and so in general, the recommendation is about 36 grams of protein for a 100 pound person. So if you're a 200 pounder, 72 grams of protein. So that's going from 100 to 70, that's about 30 grams below the average. And that, and my smart diet is probably something like 30 grams per 100 pounds. Or like if you're 200 pounds, 60 gram protein diet. That's a big stretch. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's just, that's just a moderately reduced protein intake. Now, there are these folks that are pushing very low protein diets. And what is that? That's 15 grams per 100 pounds, 30 grams for a 200 pound person. So instead of 100 grams a day, you're only gonna get 30 grams a day. Whoa, that's <laughs> almost impossible. And when they actually study this randomized controlled trial, randomize you to very low protein diet, you know, low or normal protein diet. The people on the very low protein diet, guess how many followed it? I think it's gonna to be too challenging. It's gonna be exactly. very few. Only two out of 10 people. Oh. Only two out of 10 were actually able to do it. So it's crazy, but is it indicated? And who is it indicated for? And that's what I'm gonna tell you right now. Mm -hmm. If you happen to be one of these folks that's younger, I don't recommend low protein for older folks because you're already going to be losing muscle mass. Mm -hmm. You're already going to have a tendency for malnutrition. You're already going to have a tendency for falls, which is a common cause of death. And you don't want to lose your muscle and you don't want to aggressively reduce protein. And besides that, older folks are unlikely to have a lot of protein in their urine and they don't lose kidney function rapidly. So let's say you are a younger folk and let's say it'll just pick under 60. I mean, hard to know what you're Oh, okay? I like that. Younger is <laughs> under 60. Nice. <laughs> I'm, I, that's random. Totally random. Okay. <laughs> but <clears throat> if you are not diabetic, you're under 60 and you're one of these folks with two plus protein or 300 milligrams per gram of creatinine spot protein, then you might want to consider if you're also CKD4 or CKD5. Because the studies, frankly, very few are done in CKD3. I mean, I would consider it maybe CKD3B, my personal opinion, which would be 30 to 45 GFR. 
uh, and a young person with, with a lot of protein, you might try, you might attempt to do that low protein diet. I mean, the very low protein diet, right? Uh, 15 grams per hundred pounds, right? Uh, and the goal of blood pressure we talked about earlier, 110 to 120. Mm -hmm. That's So this is, one size doesn't fit all. And if you are yep. CKD3, I mean, it is crazy to go on these very low protein diets. You're doing it for nothing. You're not at risk. You know, you're not, you're at a, unless you've got a lot of protein and you're CKD3, since you're not at a high risk of winding up on dialysis, why torture yourself? Why risk malnutrition? And certainly if you're diabetic, you shouldn't be messing with it. And, 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 and to kind of, um, address one question that a yeah. few people have asked, sure. um, as we age, our GFR does naturally go down and someone who is 20 with a GFR of 60 needs to work on things. There, there's, there's an issue there. Someone who's 70 with a GFR 60, that could be pretty normal, correct? Yeah, I, I, I work in the free clinic, James, and I actually, I don't, I haven't paid attention to the labs uh, lately, especially in retirement, but I do some, see some people in the free clinic. <laughs> and um, I was looking at labs of one of my patients, who, by the way, is a patient that has significant protein in the urine, mm -hmm. had a decline in his GFR when I put him on the ACE. I, dose, I think I put him on an ARB. They're exchangeable. Um, and I told him, I said, Mr. Patient, we could continue this drug even though your kidney function declined for the reason I just told you. And sure enough, his kidney function got back to where it was and it stayed stable. So there that's, you go. That's, that's an anecdote, but that, that's just yep. kind of makes the point. But on his labs, guess what, James? They give you the values by age. I was happy to see that. <gasps> that I've yeah. never seen that. Anywhere. Yeah. Yes. They give you the oh. value by age, which is a good change so that's that's happening. every lab should do that because yeah oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. for those of you that are new who didn't hear any of the past episodes with dr Rowe here it's normal as you get older we gotta we or let me try to think of the way to say this age is important when you're looking at your gfr we can't just say hey this number means this for everybody the older you are the lower your gfr will be and it's normal and it, it may be to where you don't have to worry because it's going to take another 40 years for it to get low enough to where you have to worry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And, and, you know, I learned this in med school, which is very, very uh, sad. They said, well, you know, how many brain cells you're born with? You're born with X, you know, billion brain cells. Well, by the time you're this age, you lost 20%. By the time you're this age, you lost 50%. So we do lose, we lose brain cells. We lose functioning kidney units with age. It's just part of the deal. We can't escape it, you know. Uh, and we lose yeah. muscle mass with age, which is another mm -hmm. reason to be careful about very low protein in older folks. So, um, so we mentioned about diet and low protein. I'm going into the factors that will affect how quickly your kidney function might decline. Yep. Um, diabetes. I'll just touch on this. A lot of diabetics feel I got to get my A1C below seven so I can keep my kidneys from getting worse. I've got some bad news. It turns out that if you don't have kidney disease already, and you're usually you're going to be a younger folk, and you're diabetic, by all means, go for it. Go for that tight sugar control, less than seven. But if you already have established kidney disease, mm -hmm. there isn't any good evidence that tightening up your blood sugar control is going to save your kidneys. Uh, and, and it's controversial. But the problem, and this is what the kidney docs from around the world in the kidney organization I'm part of, World Kidney Organization of Doctors, kidney doctors, um, they basically say that if you're older, you've already got diabetes complications like heart disease, um, you've had a heart attack, you've got some you know, other troubles from diabetes, from atherosclerosis, it's dangerous to shoot for a low sugar because you can get hypoglycemia. 
Mm -hmm. So just be careful with that. So I just want to touch on, on diabetes. And we mentioned that if you take one of these drugs and you're seeing your urine protein decline, that's a good sign. Yep. That may, that may even really if your you. GFR goes down, if your protein's going down, it's okay. Uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. That that's more important than your protein leaking well, is going down. But again, I, I don't I don't want to give a, a blanket statement. It, every patient needs to work with their kidney doctor, their kidney team, and that's another part mm -hmm. of ways to keep you out of trouble. You need to be followed by a multidisciplinary team. You can have your you can have your nurse practitioner, your physician assistant, your internist, your nephrologist, your dietitian. You want to have a team approach and you want to discuss any of the things that we're discussing with your mm -hmm. uh, providers because I'm not treating anybody. I'm just giving you some general information. And yep. that's what my book is. It provides you with the information, gives you the language, gives you the a glossary in the back with all the terms I'm mentioning here. And it's got an index for anything that we're talking about here you can look up. Bring that to your doctor and discuss it with them. You need to be in charge with your doctor on how you're managing your kidney problem. Joint management. This is not, doc, you just take care of me. You say I need to go on dialysis. That was my last, yeah, check that one out. You need to discuss starting dialysis at lower levels of kidney function. Anybody who's been told that they may need dialysis, look at my Look at the show that we did on when is the best time to start dialysis and bring yep. that information to your kidney team. Yeah. And one um, thing about that whole team thing, one thing that I did uh, in the very beginning, there was a lot of confusion. My nephrologist wanted a certain uh, target for my blood pressure, my vitamin D levels, my primary care, my family doctor who knew me very well, had different goals. So I came to the decision and I spoke to all the doctors that I work with. They need to make their recommendations to my primary care physician, the one I trust the most, and he will make the call so that they were all working together. And it worked out great. I didn't get told do this and then at a next appointment with a different doctor to change it. Everything flowed through. Everyone knew exactly what I was taking and why. Yeah. and what the expectations were because mm -hmm. I was taking that. Yeah. So it almost felt like every doctor visit, no matter who I was with, that I was getting the benefit of every doctor because they yeah. communicated so well. Right. And, and the thing is, look, there's, there's no absolutes in, in life and, and there's opinions. And just like I said, you know, if, you, if your EGFR declines on an ACE or an ARB, some doctors will say, no, I'm not going to continue the drug. And I can't say they're wrong. You know, this is just something that some kidney doctors say, hey, let's just try it for a while and follow it up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a couple other things. Let's just deal with the, the water thing. Everybody at so many sites, oh, I'm going to go to my kidney doctor. My EGFR was 46. I'm going to drink a ton of water so my oh. EGFR, my creatinine is going to be lower and I'm going to be all better. I'm going to pee out all the creatinine and have these one labs that say I'm better. <laughs> well, look, I, I, I'm laughing, but it's, you know, people are not educated and it's not an unreasonable thought. And actually it's, it's, it's reasonable. And, you know, there has been discussion as to whether or not drinking a lot of water, you don't need any special water, drinking a lot of water, tap water, uh, is beneficial for your kidneys. And I've got a colleague that I love from Canada who actually did a study, a guy named Bill. He did this study. And God bless Bill. He worked real hard on the study. It was really hard. And, you, and you know, to do these studies is tough. Randomized control, you know, you're going to either get the, the high water intake or the medium or the low water intake. Those are really hard studies to do. And he did a very good study, could not prove the benefit of, of taking in more water than your thirst tells you. Your thirst, the body is a remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. We drink as much water as we need because we get thirsty. And that mechanism is very complex. 
Um, and actually, one of my first research papers, James, was on a patient that did not have any thirst sensation. <gasps> oh, yeah, yeah that yeah, could be yeah. dangerous because yeah, dehydration yeah. is not good. Right, and and he wound up getting something called high sodium, and and that could be serious. Yeah, so uh, unless you got kidney stones, you got kidney stones. Drink a lot of water, drink a lot of water to keep those stones from forming. It just makes sense. You got something, you got a glass, you put some stuff in the glass, you want to dissolve it, add more water. So that's how it works with kidney stones. So, so water in general, no. Kidney stones, yes. There's and one, one thing, thing you mentioned about ahead. the water that I just want to yeah. emphasize, yeah. any water. Tap water, that's what I drink, yeah. tap yeah. water. Don't need to I buy get fancy questions water. every day about this kind of water, that kind of water, barley water. There's like a trillion different kinds of water out there. Tap water, H2O. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, there's there's no need to spend money on special water. I mean, some people feel that they taste better. I can't argue with people's taste, and you know, some water actually, uh, some water uh, is not very tasty. Um, I'm actually in a place uh, in South Carolina. Uh, on the coast and you don't want to drink the water from the tap so yeah i'm, I'm okay with buying bottled water if your water tastes lousy no problem with that <laughs> but there's no reason beyond that um so a couple other things and uh, one is um sodium bicarbonate oh. there is this is a it's got some promise i'm going to end up with what, I, what has a lot a lot of promise sodium bicarbonate um, is baking soda. You got it in your kitchen. Mm-hmm. And it turns out, and it's not nailed down yet. Mm-hmm. It turns out that if you, when you go to your doctor and you get your blood tests, your electrolytes, one of the tests is the bicarbonate. If that number is 22 or less, it's reasonable for you to go on sodium bicarbonate pills. There is some evidence that may, that may help slow the decline of kidney function in that situation. So, and it's not harmful unless you got to avoid sodium. Like if you have heart failure, you don't want to take a lot of salt in because that could tip you back into heart failure. But assuming your heart's okay and you can handle the sodium, if you happen to be one of these folks that has a bicarbonate on your lab test of 22 or less, sodium bicarbonate is reasonable you to take and the last thing I'm going to touch on because we only got 10 minutes I'm only going to touch on it for those of you who are diabetic there are some really really good drugs for you and these drugs are called S is in Sam G is in good L is in Larry T is in Tom S-G-L-T, that's the, the class of the drugs. The drugs have a name that ends in F-L-O-Z-I-N, Flozins. There's a bunch of them. Mm. And these drugs are extremely promising for lots of reasons. One, if you're diabetic, and they may even start using them for non-diabetics, so we got a whole new class of drugs, two new classes of drugs that may slow decline of kidney function. Certainly in diabetics, it's a, it's a diabetic drug to lower your blood sugar. This drug shows great promise. And, and uh, there's another class I'll mention, uh, my last thing I'm going to mention. What these drugs are doing is not only slowing the decline of your kidney function like the ACEs and the ARBs, and you don't even have to have high protein to benefit from them, but they may decrease your risk of death from heart disease. That is massive. Oh, yeah. Massive. They may decrease your risk of heart failure. They may decrease your risk of heart attacks. I mean, these drugs show great promise. They're the flows in drugs, uh, SGLT2s. And if you're diabetic, you may ask your doctor whether he would consider them. That deserves a whole show. Now, could, other, could that possibly yeah, work if yeah. you're pre-diabetic? Yeah. Well, okay. So 
again, it's, it's a lot of stuff to kind of wade through, but I'll just give you some high points. Um, it's, it's new. It's being mm-hmm. studied. It's like the ACEs and the ARBs, it took 20 years to get all the data that we've had on it. These drugs are just out for like, you know, five or 10 years. I mean, it's new. And the studies are coming out fast and furious. And, you know, they're first looking at most of these studies. They don't want to look at people with CKD4. They only want to look at CKD3. But it seems that like they're probably going to be okay regardless of your level of kidney function, which is really good news, number one. Um, And they may even wind up being prescribed for non-diabetics. The jury's out. So there's a lot of promise in these drugs. And certainly if you're diabetic, I would look into them. And the other class of drugs for diabetics, these end in TIDE, the drugs that end in TIDE, they're the G is in good, L is in Larry, P is in Paul, the GLP-1 drugs. And they have similar benefits to the SGLT-2 drugs. This is a mouthful. <laughs> So um, if you're diabetic, I would at least look into that a little bit further. And, and that's, that's my main pitch, and we can answer some questions. Yeah, awesome. Oh, awesome. So much good stuff. I had not even heard about those drugs. Um, now, I'm not a fan of pills. I take all the ones I need, my blood pressure pills, my multivitamins, things like that. I take those, but... Uh, Anything that'll help my kidneys is definitely worth talking to my doctor about to see. You know, I'm no longer pre-diabetic, right? And it may be too early, right. based on the amount of information that's out there. So let me take a look and see if there's questions that we uh, that are related somewhat to our topic that we haven't touched on. I'll, uh, I'll just mention. Let me just yeah. mention pre-diabetes while you're looking for a question. Mm-hmm. Um, I am in the thick of trying to write a book for diabetics. It's an enormous task. It's gonna take me a good year. Um, But James, pre-diabetes is curable. And the lifestyle stuff that we talk about for CKD patients to decrease your risk of hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis, is in spades, goes in spades for anyone who's diabetic. Because diabetics are at the highest risk of getting those bad outcomes from atherosclerosis. And you can cure diabetes with exercise and diet, with the smart diet, with the plant-based diet, and and daily exercise can actually cure diabetes. So that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, and And that's exactly, that's what my doctors had me do. Exercise more, eat better, more plant-based, you know, more help more of what i should be eating instead of the gigantic platefuls yeah and it didn't take but maybe six months or so for my a1c to get to normal which was great Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let me shut this off um and and actually james i found out i didn't even know about this that there was a massive nih study that proved what i just told you so this is not just this is not just, well, hey, this is a good idea. This has been proved with thousands of patients, and it really works. And they also use, in combination with diet and exercise, they use a drug called metformin, and we can't get into that tonight, which yep. is a great I'll tell you, Eating drug. healthy and being more active does so much for us. It's amazing. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. No question. <laughs> so Joy asked, can you spell those diabetic drugs again? Okay, so... Um, I'll give you the uh, the one, I think it's one of the first ones that came out. It's C as in car, A as in apple, N as in Nancy, A as in apple, G as in good, L as in Larry, I as in igloo. So can egli, and, it, and all of these end in F-L-O-Z-I-N. And there's now three or four of them that are out there. Yeah. Very good. Now, here's a question, and, and you may not know. I have not heard of this. Um, RT is asking, is Suprep bad for kidneys? Never heard of it. Sorry. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> maybe maybe they're talking about a prep for a bowel, an enema. I mean, it's the, I if, you're taking, if you're taking a prep 
for a colonoscopy or a GI study, those are not bad for kidneys. That Those are okay. I'll answer that. <laughs> yep. And here's one you may not have much experience with. Renadil is a probiotic, so it's not FDA approved because it's not a drug that the FDA covers. Uh, it's something I take. I My doctor recommended it. I took labs. I took it for 90 days along with a healthy diet, being active and everything else. And then we got new labs and I saw positive results and they have rented the, the, the makers of Renadil, chemo, chemo biotech. They have data they've published showing that it could help some kidney patients. And the way it works is it's a probiotic. So it's, it's you're focusing on your gut health so that hopefully you're, well, you're kind of passing, pooping out less of the bad stuff that normally would get absorbed in your blood that then your kidneys would have to absorb or, or, or filter out. Are you familiar with it? Because a few people are asking for your opinion on Renadel. Yeah. So I was going to be on our colleagues. I was on our colleagues show and they've got Renadil as one of their sponsors. Uh -huh. And I looked it up and I looked at some of my colleagues that uh, actually have endorsed it. I will say that I'm not a fan of any of that stuff. It's not something that's studied with the kind of stuff that the FDA requires. You're not going to have thousands of patients. You're not going to have large randomized controlled trials that are going to prove that it really works. I'm okay with anything that doesn't harm you. And, and, and if people find that it helps, I'm okay with whatever helps if it's not going to harm you, but I would not necessarily recommend it personally. Yeah. Now we are at the top of our hour, but there's one question just popped through and you and I were kind of briefly discussing this just before the show started. I'm not going to share my opinion because I think everyone or the regulars know my opinion on this, but Marla asked, what about stem cell treatments? What's your thoughts on that? We are nowhere near understanding how stem cells works other than for what they call blood type malignancies like lymphomas and certain blood cancers, leukemias, possibly. Um, those are very well studied. And in certain cases, people can get a stem cell transplant that could save their lives in those kinds of situations. Beyond that, we are nowhere near having science that will be supporting taking stem cells for anything else that I'm aware of. That's my yep. general opinion on it. Yep. Same thing. It's the wild, wild west out there, everybody. I believe there's something with stem cells down the road in the future. Right now, there's nothing for kidney disease except a way for you to spend a whole lot of money and get nothing in return. All right, we are at the top of the hour. I'd like to ask all of you, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. That way, every time I schedule future shows, you get a notification. And speaking of future shows, someone asked, hey, I heard there's going to be an artificial kidney. Well, guess who's going to be here this Friday the 13th? We will have Dr. Roy from UC San Francisco, I remember it correctly, talking about the implantable artificial and kid artificial kidney the progress they've made and still what's ahead and how they're using some of the breakthroughs they've come across while working on the implantable artificial kidney to improve home dialysis with a soon to be available device known as the eye hemo that'll be this friday we've got jen back here tomorrow talking about recipes for the holidays because hey thanksgiving christmas and all sorts of stuff is right around the corner and dr butt will be back here on wednesday we got a busy week so we'll see you guys later this week and dr Rowe, thank you very much for being here always great to have you everyone loves when you're here speaking in a way that we can understand about things that really matter to us all right everybody We'll see you in the next video. Bye, all.